again and welcome back. It is time for chapter 23, where we're going to talk about uh, <laughs> being pregnant and growth and development, which is actually kind of interesting, especially when we get into the growth and development and the being pregnant part. Well, you're going to get to hear all about that. And um, from when I was just talking about somebody, uh, yeah, it sounds like uh, one of you might be pregnant out there. So yeah, you probably are going through all this fun jazz right now. Yay. <laughs> anyway, so uh, let's go ahead and jump in, shall we? All righty. So. All right. Yeah. Fertilization. So when the egg hits the sperm actually it's really weird we're going to talk about it it's actually as i mentioned in the last couple of lectures it is not about who wins the race and we're going to find that out in a minute it's actually you should be about mid-pack because it takes a while to actually fertilize an egg because once again women don't make it easy on you guys sorry about it but it's true all right so happens in the infibidium which is right here and like i said sometimes when um you know the oocyte is actually re released uh sometimes it can fertilize and then fall back out it actually does there is a way for it to get sucked up in which is actually really useful but um sometimes it can fertilize and fall out which is not cool um, which I was mentioning in the last lecture can lead to calcified uh, fetuses in the body. And there was actually a woman that was uh, technically pregnant with one for years and didn't realize it until she finally, because she was in a remote village of Iraq, I want to say. And finally, finally, she convinced her husband to, or her son drug her to a, a hospital. And they did, they had to do a surgery, go in, and they pulled out a huge calcified chunk that was... Um, that was at one point what had happened is she had gotten fertilized and it had fallen out and started growing in her abdomen instead of, um, you know, where it's supposed to go into the uterus and um, the body, it didn't survive very long, but the body covered it in calcium because like I said, whereas, you know, pearls are made through uh, oysters uh, uh, putting mother of pearl on an irritant, we kind of don't have something as cool as mother of pearl, we just cover it in calcium. Because that's our body's best way to do it. So sometimes you'll get these these calcium cysts, which are kind of weird. Anyway, so moving on that. So again, secondary oocyte can only survive for about 12 to 24 hours following ovulation, but sperm can last for six days in a woman's body if conditions are favorable. Um, but they work best between 24 to 48 hours. Sperm are really inefficient, as I was mentioning in the last couple of lectures, which is why you guys make about 200 to 600 million in a go. Um, because A, they don't ask for directions. B, they kind of have to go through, uh, their own version of the, uh, the, those ninja obstacle courses, uh, uh, like on TV and things. Because they're, they're hitting patches of, of cells of, pieces of the immune system they're attacking it, the fact that, you know, the whole thing past the cervix up in here is usually kind of acidic and it prefers more alkaline. Um, so they, and they, they don't, like I said, they kind of have one direction and it's go. So, you know, some guys are getting stuck down here. Some guys are getting stuck everywhere. They don't know which way to turn. They choose the wrong ovarian tube because there's two of them. And yeah, and so, like I said, they don't know where they're going. They're not asking for directions. And it's that's why, guys, you have to make so many of them because unfortunately they're like and running around trying to find the egg. So the fallopian tubes actually do assist the sperm, though. It's the only place in the woman's body that says like, come on, come on, you're safe this way. So if they get up into the fallopian tube, then they're okay to go find the egg if there is one. Like I said, sometimes there's not, and there's nobody there, and they're all like, oh well. Anyway, so, fallopian tubes do assist the sperm, however, progesterone makes the female secrete a fluid that hampers them. So, yeah, yeah, this is, I guess, why women are so confusing. Kidding. We're not confusing to us. Anyway, so if a male sperm actually survives linging off the egg, now he has to dig. I'm not kidding you. So around the egg is this thing called the cornea radiata. 
And they literally have to dig their way through that. And unfortunately, like I said, the first guy does not win the race. He does not fertilize. So the movie, the beginning of the movies of um, Look Who's Talking, Look Who's Talking too, are lying to you. Yes, indeed. It is not the first sperm that meets the egg. No, no, no. They actually, uh, a lot of the guys that go ahead, and there's actually two types of sperm come to find out. We like to call them the uh, regular sperm and the suicidal sperm. I don't think it's actually suicidal sperm. We call it the uh, destroyers? I don't, there's a technical term for them and I'm trying to remember what it was and I can't think of it right now. But they're basically like kamikaze. They're designed to actually take out other sperm. They'll actually veer off course and destroy another sperm, whether it's its own brother or not, or sister. Um, so, yeah, weird. <laughs> so, kind of weird. So we've got ones that kind of will be like, ah, I'm going to blow up another sperm. Um, so, interestingly enough, they do have this, they have to punch through the corner radiata, and then they have to dig through the zona particulata, which are perlicute, perlicita. Thank you, sorry, my brain's like going, ooh. Then they have to dig through that. The way they do it is they have this acrosome at the front, and it's a little area that's filled with digestive enzymes, and they pop it. But the problem is when they pop it, it helps them dig through, but it kills that sperm. So that sperm basically sacrifices itself so that one of his brethren or sisterin can get on through to push through to the proto-nucleus and fuse to make the nucleus. So, yeah, so, yeah, it, it, it pays to be in the middle of the pack, not first on the scene, because you have to wait for somebody to dig through for you, and then you can get through and push through finally, get in, release your nuclei, and then the egg proto-nucleus and the uh, sperm proto-nucleus swell up and merge together to form the nuclei of the fertilized zygote. So, yeah, it's a whole thing, and Mother Nature doesn't make it easy. So again, once the two protonuclei swell up and merge into one, the process of fertilization is complete, and you get a zygote. Congrats, you might get pregnant. Might. That's if the thing embeds. Remember, we have things that make it stop embedding, or the fact that your body already thinks you're pregnant, so it just shoots it on out. Because, again, it may be fertilized, but if it doesn't implant in the uterus, you don't get baby. So, the zygote undergoes mitosis into smaller and smaller cells, so it goes from fertilization to a zygote, then splits into four, eight, or excuse me, splits into two, four, and then when it hits 16 cells, it's called a morula. And that is then going to turn into a blastocyst, and we'll get to the difference in that. So they go through splitting and splitting and splitting, which is called cleavage. And the cells are called blastomeres. So after three days, the zygote is now a solid ball of 16 cells, which is our friend, the morula. Then it will turn into a hollow ball of cells, which is called the blastocyst. And then it will implant, hopefully, into the uterine lining, and then you are pregnant. So, the morula hangs out in the uterus for about three days as cell division continues and it turns into a hollow ball of cells called blastocyst, which superficially implants itself in the endometrium. Apparently, people can feel this. Apparently, it feels like a little ow, and that's about it, if you remember feeling it. Considering any given day, I mean, I have bruises on my legs. I don't even know where I got them from, and I think this is most people. I really don't know how you can just figure out one body pain and go, oh, I'm pregnant. But anyway, apparently you can feel when the blastocyst implants. I don't remember it, so I couldn't tell you. And uh, blastocyst, uh, in blastocyst, one region forms an inner cell mass, which will become the embryo proper, and the rest will form a wall around it, which makes up the tropoblast. This is implantation is where the blastocyte completely nestles itself into the uterine lining, and we basically get an exchange between the new cells of what might be a baby at one point and the mother cells. And this is going to turn into the placenta. You're going to see that right here. So here he is. He comes up and he meets. And we've got the inner mass right here, which is the embryo proper and the tropoblast that surrounds it. Then you get the blastocyst cavity and the lumen of the uterus right here, the urethane and the 
endometrial endothelium. And what you'll see is it starts putting out uh, synchrogeotropoblasts uh, and endometrial stoma with blood vessels and glands. And this is going to become soon um, the placenta. And this is going to become the future embryo. Now the placenta is important because we are basically carrying a new life form around inside of us. And we don't want our immune system to destroy this thing instantaneously. So we have to actually kind of make something that allows for transfer of food and nutrients and oxygen to go back and forth through them, but doesn't let our immune system go through and murder uh, this new life form that is now has different DNA and is separate from us. And so remember different flags on all the cells. That's what a placenta is. A placenta is made up of uh, both the mother cells and the baby cells to give a wall to protect and to anchor the baby into us. So the placenta is a vascular structure formed by the cells surrounding the embryo and the cells of the endometrium that anchors the embryo to the uterine wall and exchanges nutrients, gases, and wastes between the maternal blood and the embryo's blood. And also other things too, which is actually what kind of find out um, now that I've you know been pregnant twice, um, one didn't go so well. Um, but, um, you know, um, I actually have the DNA of both of those, uh, both my son and what could have been, uh, floating around in my body right now. So actually we do get to keep our own kid's DNA inside of us. Um, and, but while the baby is growing, it can actually, uh, release some of its cells if the mother is damaged in any form or fashion to, uh, help her. We've actually seen that when, like, a a pregnant mother has a heart attack, that sometimes they'll release cells to help, um, stabilize the heart, which is actually kind of interesting, but it all has to pass through the placenta. So the tropoblast releases HCG hormone that keeps the mother's immune system from rejecting the embryo. So that's another reason why we need that tropoblast there, which is this part right here. He starts putting stuff out that says, don't kill me, and the immune system is like, eh. So anyway, so the chorion is the second layer of the tropoblast. It shoots out chronic villi, which again turns into placenta. Locune is regular spaces filled with maternal blood, vessels for placenta development. Amnion, which develops around the embryo, it's attached to the embryonic disc, which is the space believed with amniotic fluid. This is what basically the growing, developing fetus is going to be floating around in. You got your umbilical cord, which develops out of the amnion into your, of course, your belly button. And the yolk sac and the allantois, which is uh, sex cells, stem cells of bone marrow, allantois, umbilical cord, blood vessels. And then you got the placental membrane, which separates the embryonic blood in the chronic villus from the maternal blood in the lacunae. So that way you have a bit of a barrier between the two. So again, the body doesn't try to murder it. Um, because your immune system, let's face it, is always turned on murder. <laughs> We should call that the murder system, but that's okay. Anyway, so gastrulation. This is the movement of cells within the embryonic disc to form multiple layers. And there's three primary germ layers. And we talked about this earlier, and we're going to talk about it again, because this is basically what's going to turn into what inside of our body. So the endoderm is the inner layer. It turns into our digestive and our respiratory systems. The mesoderm is the middle layer. It turns into our muscles, our bones, our lymphatic system, our reproductive system, and our kidneys. And then the ectoderm, which is the outer layer, which turns into our nervous system, our parts of our sensory organs, skin, glands, linings of the mouth, and the anus. And the process of organs forming is called organogenesis. And oh, by the way, your embryo has now just become a gastrula. And you'll notice the gastrula is different because what happens is the again, the zygote, eight, then it goes to the morula, then the blastula, which is the hyde cell. And then what happens is we get it pushed in at one end. And now we are in what is known as a sleeping bag arrangement. Some creatures keep the sleeping bag arrangement where they only have one opening. And that would be like sea cucumbers and whatnot, where their mouth is also their anus. Thankfully, we turn into our tube within a tube body type. Thank God. So our mouth is very much separated from our anus. But we go into the sleeping, this is called the sleeping bang arrangement. So again, what you get is you get got blastopore right here, you got your ectoderm on the outside, your endoderm on the inside, and your mesoderm hanging out right in the middle there. And those are the three primary germ layers, which gives a rise to all of your different organ systems. Pretty crazy, isn't it?
So again, he goes into this about uh, fertilization and whatnot. So you can go ahead and watch that. So twins, a lot of people, and I added this into the notes. Um, and that is because a lot of people ask me about how twins form and some interesting twin facts. This is not entirely covered in your book, which I think is dumb because a lot of people have questions about this. So basically, Overall, there's two types of twins. There's the fraternal twins and the identical twins. And there's different ways you can get identical twins. Fraternals is pretty easy. Basically, what happens is the mother releases two eggs. And the two eggs usually get fertilized completely separately by different sperm. And each embryo plants in the womb separately. And you just happen to have two babies in the same place. Uh, fraternal twins are usually what we're getting when we're getting... Um, like all those multiples, like Octomom, when she decided to get pumped up on a ton of fertilization, uh, it actually meant she was releasing more than one egg. So, like the people that have multiples, it usually just means the woman has released a ton of different eggs. And because of this, you get a whole bunch, you're basically having a whole brother and sister party instead of waiting in between years. You just have them all at the same time, which can put a lot of stress on you. Um, so that's basically fraternal twins and why fraternal twins don't come out looking identical. Sometimes they kind of do, and that's only just because of genetic luck. Um, but most of the time, they just look like two people that are just happen to be brother and sister that decided to be conceived and, you know, have everything at the same time. Because it's two different eggs, two different sperm. Anyway. Now, identical twins are monozygotic twins. Usually what happens is one egg is released and is fertilized by one sperm. However, when these guys start splitting, sometimes they will split so hard, you know, when they're splitting uh, back here, when they're going through cleavage, instead of cleaving normally and staying stuck together, they cleave so hard, they cleave right apart into two, <laughs> basically two of these guys. So it just depends on when it cleaves so hard it splits into two. So for instance, early embryo splits before implant implanting. That's uh, one way. And what happens is you get two separate babies with two separate placentas, which is the good thing. Um, separate placentas usually means, and separate inner sacs is probably a better way because that means both babies are being fed separately and have a better chance of survival. So these are the ideal identical twin situation right here because separate placentas mean um, they both have their own blood and uh, food supply and oxygen supply from mom and they don't have to share. However, sometimes when it implants in the womb and then it splits, what happens is you will get a shared placenta between that and separate inner sacs, which is fine. Um, but it, it um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes one of the twins will suffer from this because like I said, sometimes one twin gets more than the other twin and that can lead to issues uh, health-wise and whatnot-wise, if they're sharing a placenta. Like I said, separate placentas usually mean better better odds. But, and then last but not least is when the em embryo implants in the womb, but then splits later. I mean, like, way later than this one. And that, unfortunately, gives rise to a shared placenta and a shared inner sac. And this can lead to a lot of complications. This can also lead to conjoined twins. This can also lead to things like um, losing one of the twins. This can also lead to um, uh, mergers, you know, where one twin kind of absorbs the other twin. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. Um, like I said, the best, the best one is usually when it splits early before it implants, this is your favorable one. Fraternals don't have to worry about this. Because, like I said, fraternals are always separate, so you're going to have two separate placentas and basically two separate inner sacs. So, now, other fun facts. Very rarely, fraternal twins sh share a placenta. However, these types of twins do exist, and they're called chimeric twins. Uh, sharing a placenta means that the twin shares a blood supply during pregnancy. Sometimes the blood supply is shared unequally, which can lead to health problems for both twins. Now, this is one we don't understand 
at all. And that is there are some identical twins that are called mirror twins. For example, their hair parts on opposite sides of the body. They're oppositely handed, like one is right, the other one's left. They have birthmarks on opposite sides of their bodies. In some rare cases, their internal organs are mirror images of each other. So it's not known why twins, some twins do this. So yeah, sometimes you'll get a mirror twin where like, you know, normal people, heart points this way down and, and the mirror twin, um, they have one where their heart is pointing this way down. Isn't that insane? So yeah, mirror twins are kind of weird and we still don't understand why they happen. In very rare cases, twins can be born physically joined together in different ways. These twins are called conjoined twins, previously called Siamese twins, which is now kind of racist, if you know, saying it. Because a lot of these twins kind of came out of those areas, especially third world countries, because of poor nutrition. And then, you know, people used to put them in, like, P.T. Barnum and stick them in, uh, you know. Actually, it was one of the ways they could make a lot of money in some cases. We actually did have a very famous case of Siamese twins or uh, conjoined twins here in North Carolina. They actually had married sisters and had kids, uh, which is crazy. This can happen if the fertilized egg splits very late after fertilization. So, uh, yeah, conjoined twins are not always great. Uh, sometimes they can live fine, but sometimes they cannot. Um, it's really kind of... Oof. Triplets, which is one in every 5,000 births, and quadruplets, which is less than one in every 100,000 births, excuse me, can develop from a result of combination of fraternal and identical twinning. There are no reliable figures for quintuplets or sextuplets, because uh, they're so rare. Like I said, a lot of the ones, including the one woman um, known as Octomom, she actually got pregnant with that many kids because she had a doctor that was kind of... Uh, breaking the law by uh, basically what happens if you go in for in vitro fertilization, they usually put you on drugs for you to ovulate, which is why you get lovely mood swings and all sorts of things because it's like periods on steroids to make you ovulate more. And then they collect those eggs after you ovulate. And then you take those eggs and then you fertilize them in a lab. And usually when you take those eggs and you fertilize them in the lab, they only take so many. And number two, they only take... Um, they only implant a couple because if you put one in, it's probably not going to implant. So that's why they hedge their bets and get them fertilized and then stick them in the mom, back in mom um, to see which one will implant. And they usually put in about three or four and usually one implants. Sometimes more than one will implant. Well, in Octomom, um, he put in more than normal, which at her age was actually extremely dangerous. And they stuck in and she had eight implant. So the doctor was breaking the law. He lost his medical license afterwards and she became a phenomenon, but she was apparently obsessed with just having kids. And she had like, even before that, she had IVF, even though she didn't need IVF to have other kids. I think she has like a total of like 10 kids because she had two before and then another two that were kind of like twins. And then she had that Eight. It was nuts. Anyway, um, so, yeah. A lot of these days, the, the quintuplets and sextuplets, they're so rare, but now it's like IVF. If you've got a doctor that's willing to do illegal things, you can definitely have more than one kid at a time. Not recommended, though, because we are not built for that. Uh, the reason why, like, cats and dogs and pigs can have uh, multiples is because their uteruses are different from ours. Like, um, if we were going in and I was showing you, um, you know, as I was giving you a fetal pig and you had a female and you were looking at her uterus, you would see it looks very, very different from a human uterus because theirs is actually lobed and actually has chambers for extra babies to go into. So therefore they can have more than one child at a time. We specialize because we have such big fat heads and big fat brains that we usually stick to one kid at a time, possibly two. But anything beyond that is dangerous because we're just not, our uterus is not built for that. Uh, unlike, you know, pigs and cats and, and sheep and because they can usually have more than one because your uterus is actually shaped to uh, house more than one fetus at a time. So if you ever wondered the difference, it's because 
they have a differently arranged uterus than we do. So anyway, so there you go. There's some twin facts. I hope that caught your interest about twins. I, at one point I thought about, you know, wouldn't it be nice if I just had twins and got it all out of the way? And then I'm glad now that I look at my son and he runs around like a maniac and it, how much it took to put him to sleep. I don't envy people with twins having two babies at the same time. Oh my goodness. One baby was overwhelming. Two babies. Woo! You need a whole support network. You know, they say it takes a village. And in some cases, boy, does it. Anyway, with that said, I'll let you go. And then we're going to get into the second half, which is growth and development of the fetus inside of the mother and all the fun, crazy things that happen there, which is actually, again, insanely fascinating. So I'll see you in a bit. Bye.